Again, for those just hopping on, my name is Cynthia Gordigiwa, Marketing Director at ProPublica and your host for tonight. Thank you for joining us. This conversation grew out of um, a recent article by ProPublica reporter Anna Clark called The Unfinished Business of Flint's Water Crisis. In the piece, Anna says that criminal charges against public officials and a pending class action settlement may seem like the last chapter in Flint's story, but many of the most important reforms at the root of the city's water crisis remain undone. So we'll talk about this and much more with a terrific group of experts you see on your screen, who I'll introduce now. So first we have Anna Clark, um, a ProPublica reporter based in Detroit, Michigan, covering issues in the Midwest. She is the author of The Poison City, Flint's Water and the American Urban Tragedy, uh, which won the Hillman Prize for Book Journalism and the Rachel Carson Environment Book Award. We have Jaquanda Johnson, a veteran journalist and founder of Brown Impact Media Group, a publishing company that develops media products in underserved and marginalized communities. She is the founder and publisher of Flint Beat, a new site covering Flint City Hall, neighborhoods and public health issues. Uh, e. Yvonne Lewis is the founding director at the National Center for African American Health Consciousness. As a community health advocate and consultant, she translates complex information in order to answer community questions and meet community needs. Um, and Benjamin Pauly is an assistant professor of social science at Kettering University. He's the board president of the Environmental Transformation Movement of Flint a member of the US EPA's National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, and the author of Flint Fights Back, Environmental Justice and Democracy in the Flint Water Crisis. And finally, we have our moderator, Talia Buford. Talia is the Talent Development Director for ProPublica, where she oversees staff development and recruitment efforts. And before that, she was an environmental reporter here at ProPublica, Politico, and for other um, outlets covering disparities in environmental impacts. In addition, Talia was born and raised in Flint, Michigan. So our panel will also answer some of your questions tonight. If you'd like to submit a question at any point during the webinar, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And now I'll throw it over to our moderator, Talia Buford. Talia. Great, thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, first, thank you to everyone who is uh, joining us and watching us from wherever you are uh, in, in the country or in the world, possibly. Um, we're glad that you're a part of this conversation. And I want to say thank you to the panelists. Um, I'm really excited to get into conversation with you. So let's uh, hop right into it. Um, Anna, I'm going to assume that most of the people tuning in here know at least generally of the Flint water crisis, which started in 2014 when the city switched its source of water from Lake Huron to Flint to the Flint River and eventually switched back, right? So, but even within Michigan, there are a lot of confused narratives about what's been happening since the crisis rose to national infamy. To start us off, can you give us the lay of the land and help orient where we are today? You're muted. Yep. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I, of course, I'd be very glad to. Um, so as you suggested, so the Flint water crisis happened, you know, here in the Great Lakes state, and there's a whole lot of reasons why it was a purely man-made disaster. And that goes both um, in, for the realm of um, the reasons why the city was vulnerable in the first place, as well as a series of decisions that happened um during the time of this ill-fated water switch um so this switch happened in 2014 under while well, the city was under a series of emergency managers um the idea was that they were going to treat the um uh, treat flint's water at the rebooted old uh, water plant uh, using water from the local river but the problem is this old water plant did not get the staffing or the resources it needed to treat the water properly in some ways as that violated the law. So this led to highly corrosive water being sent through the pipes, breaking down those pipes, a problem that um, gets worse the longer it's ignores, ignored. And um, it also led to toxic lead being getting into the water as well as E. coli bacteria and other contaminants. There was also a two year outbreak of uh, Legionnaire's disease uh, connected to the water, which is actually what killed people and is what's related to most of the most recent criminal charges. Um, it took 18 months of 
pretty extraordinary community organizing and citizen science before the city returned to Detroit's water. But uh, the crisis didn't end there, not least because the pipes, um, the citywide infrastructure was corroded. Um, there's also been this long tail of uh, a search for accountability um, for the choices that caused and prolonged this. That's kind of an open question right now um, in this uh, second wave of criminal charges that we've uh, recently seen. Um, we're um, at the brink of a probable class action settlement being finalized soon. Um, I understand some of our panelists, folks in Flint have just gotten some papers today about registering for that. Um, there they are. <laughs> there they are. Uh, so it seems in a lot of ways we're at this last chapter um, of the water crisis, but the, there are systematic reforms that caused and prolonged this crisis that have not yet been addressed. And of course, a lot of people have questions, doubts, concerns about, about the charges, about the terms of the settlement that um, they're wrestling with right now. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, Jaquanda, I'm gonna to turn to you now. So as Anna just mentioned, you know we had the first round of charges that were announced back in 2017. Um, I remember there being sort of you know widespread outrage uh, that Governor Snyder had not been uh, among those charged during that period. Um, now he's a part of this indictment, you know that we've uh, recently heard about. Um, albeit it's a, a misdemeanor that carries like a maximum you know one year sentence, and you know so that's that's a whole other story. But as a journalist, specifically someone who is covering this community um, and, and in touch with, you know, the, this community and kind of the pulse of it, can you talk a little bit about the public perception of the recent indictments and whether community members see this as a, a step toward justice? Um, I think that a, a lot of us are, were even surprised that Snyder was charged, right? We really thought that it, it would never happen. And it happened, but there's still no real sense of justice there. You know, um, we're still going through the court process. He's been charged, but there's still nothing, right? No one has been sentenced to anything. No one has come out of pocket for anything. The community is still suffering. And they're living through that every day, no matter what's happening in the court systems. And so we still have people who are, they don't trust their water right? They're paying some of the highest water bills in the nation. I think on average, Flint residents can pay $140 per month in water and fees alone in an economically depressed community, right? So there, there's still no, from what I'm getting from community members, there's still no real sense of justice here. And the settlement itself, everything, there's too many questions, there's not a specific dollar figure. Like if you do go for this, what do you get? We really don't have the answers. Even as journalists, is it more doors we open and more confusing it becomes as we're trying to explain this thing to residents. And so there's definitely a lot of questions, a lot of distrust, and we're still trying to figure it out. And no sense of, yeah, I feel like I was made whole. Like that's not happening at all. Yeah. Um, ben, I want you to pick up on the um, settlement and the and the uh, that whole issue. Um, obviously, in addition to the settlement, there is this class action lawsuit. Um, can you tell us what's happening? Um, what that let's that, that settlement rather would do for impacted residents? And um, as Jaquanda is mentioning, you know, kind of your assessment of whether or not these remedies are actually meaningful in in any real way. Sure. Uh, first, uh, maybe a little history is in order. In, in 2017, um, the large number of civil lawsuits spawned by the crisis were consolidated into one massive class action suit. And in August of last year, it was announced that some of the defendants in that suit, most notably the state of Michigan, were prepared to settle with the state putting up the lion's share of the money, $600 million. Uh, the city of Flint later decided to settle as well, kicking in 20 million. So the, the pot stands at about 641 million right now total. Other defendants, including the engineering firms Veolia and LAN, as well as the EPA are opting to fight rather than settle. So depending on how things go with them, there might be more money coming, but for now, 641 million is what's on the table, which might sound like a lot, but there are some important caveats. Uh, for one thing, a, a significant percentage will be carved off for attorney's fees, of course. 
And also whether any particular resident gets a piece and how big of a piece they get is dependent on several criteria, which some say are not fair or reasonable. So first of all, children are going to get more than adults and that's probably as it should be, but for many, maybe most adults, it's gonna be pretty hard to get much of anything. If you're a homeowner, you might get $1,000 if you're lucky for property damage. But beyond that, you're going to have to prove that your health was detrimentally impacted by the water. And that means you need documentation. And there are a whole lot of people who don't have doctor's notes linking specific ailments to the water. So many adult residents are going to end up with what will seem like an insultingly small compensation for the expense, hardship, and harm that they've endured. As for kids, the, the settlement proposal is notable in that it considers exposure to the water alone to be grounds for at least some compensation. And it also provides a little more money if the child lived in a home with a lead service line. If you want more than that though, again, you need documentation of health harm. That means a blood lead test or a bone lead scan or a psychological assessment demonstrating a developmental delay. Um, I, if you're like me, you didn't manage to get your child's blood tested in time for it to matter. And you haven't been able to get a bone lead scan because until recently, these haven't been available to the vast majority of residents. And so now there's a big long line. Uh, the psychological assessments have also been hard to get. So aside from the people who are, who are going to fall through the cracks because they simply can't document harm for whatever reason, even those who have a chance of doing so using these methods probably aren't going to have the data prior to the opt-in deadline at the end of next month. So it's hard to make an informed decision about whether, whether this settlement is likely to put the kind of money in your pocket you think you deserve. So you know the most practical thing might end up being to take what's on the table. Uh, I mean, even to get this settlement proposal took years worth of legal battles and negotiation and opting out of it means an uphill fight. But people are understandably reluctant to settle for less than what they think is just. And at the very least, a lot of folks are feeling trapped between a rock and a hard place and also kind of disrespected all over again to some extent, because even though the settlement proposal has some good qualities, I think it seems to a lot of residents like the institutions that harmed them are still trying to wriggle out of taking full responsibility. Um, thank you for that. Um, Yvonne, I, I want to have you, I saw you nodding. But I want to <laughs> I I hear what you're thinking about it, I mean, especially since you know, as a, as a health advocate and a community member, um, you know, you have been, you know, able to, to see, I mean, as all, as all of you have, right, so much of this up close, right, you know, we saw a lot of the, you know, the images of the water crisis, like, you know, the distribution lines and the pallets of, of water, but, you know, you guys had to live it. And so, I guess, as from your perch, can you tell us a little bit about what you think about this settlement and, and whether it addresses the actual, you know, financial, mental, or emotional needs of the people of Flint? Yes, Talia, thank you so much. And I, I'd like to first say, yes, I'm nodding because it is the lived experience. And sometimes we're asked that question, now that it isn't so popular, and we're not in the national media every day, you'll get the question, is it over yet? And absolutely, it's not over yet. We still have people in long lines every week, a couple times a week, getting food and water from help centers that were set up during the water crisis to make sure that they can get the resources that they need. So no, it's not over yet. When we think about the fact that, you know, we're still having bottled water, you know, I have water in my cabinet right now because I'm not comfortable with the water in the tap because it's more than just did they switch the water back but the infrastructure still has a lot of things that need to be repaired. So that's the question. I have a blue flag outside of my house right now that reminds me every day that it's not over yet. Uh, and so then when you think about having to cook and brush your teeth every day, you're constantly reminded that this is not over. And so when you talk about the water settlement, I mean, the, the settlement, I agree with the other panelists. No, it, it, it isn't sufficient. Will one say something is better than nothing? I think that's the point Ben is making. However, people have died. Children are ill. There's emotional and, and, and trauma that you cannot walk away from. So is it over? Absolutely not. And I think I said this, and thank you, Anna, for a, an interview just a, a few weeks ago. And, and, I, and I said it, and I will continue to say it. Um, Every single physical, emotional issue that arises 
will take you back to 2014 to the water switch. Is this a result of something that happened during that time? Because even when we were told to boil the water, not knowing that there were contaminants and especially lead in the water, that you cannot boil away a heavy metal. So you've concentrated now the metals that you put in your body, but it isn't alone, that alone either. So the other contaminants, there's still questions out there. So it's the what if. What's going to happen next? In the back of my mind and in the back of the minds of other members in this community, what is the impact of that exposure? We have no idea. Will a settlement remedy that? I don't think so. Especially, a set, and, and then indictments that have no teeth. Surely nobody wants to act just as, you know, we're not hoping and wishing somebody goes to jail in some cases, but there is this sense of justice that is missing in these conversations. So is it over? Absolutely not. It's an ongoing story that I think it's, it's important for us to continue to share because our lives every day are imp impacted by what happened. Thank you for that. Um, this is a, a, a random question, but um, for I guess our panelists who live in Flint, do you, do you guys drink the water out of the tap? Oh, I, I'll take that, no. <laughs> Uh, that's why I say you got water on your counter and you've got water in your bathtub. Anything you have to eat or ingest or, or in any way. Now, there are people, I will say, there are people who have become comfortable to the extent that they will use a water filter because we have had that conversation and use the water filter. Uh, so to the, to the extent that people are comfortable using a water filter, but I do think this has created an ongoing question that even when you go to another city, for some of us, you'll flush the, flush the faucet before you use it. And you would opt for a bottle of water than opting to drink out of the faucet. So it, it, it's, it's, it, it's dependent upon where a person is and their comfort levels are. But I think you'll find that many people are still greatly concerned about what's happening with the Flint water. Jaquanda, you're muted. I remember interviewing a young lady who she had Legionnaire. She was one of the people who contracted Legionnaires but didn't know it. And um, she had moved to North Carolina and she said she was still scared to drink water out of, out of the tap. So she still drank bottled water. Um, I know people who have filters, who had pipes replaced and they're still using bottled water. Some of them are using bottled water to cook, still brush their teeth. They just don't trust the water. And I, I completely understand that no matter what the government says. They were poisoned by the government, right? And so it's a level of distrust there that it'll take years and years, you know, to forget or tuck this away, like the trauma itself, years before people trust water here in Flint. And I'll just say really quickly, although I, I do personally drink the filtered wa water, um, you know, I've had to make choices about whether to give that to my kids, depending on their age. The, the, the filters are not a one size fits all solution for a variety of reasons. And so I think it's, it's worth pointing that out. And that's one of the reasons why residents continue to insist upon having access to bottled water. Absolutely. Um, my family who still lives there, they uh, didn't want to put the filter on because, you know, it would have required a whole new um, faucet and all this other stuff. It just was like, I, no, we replaced our whole faucet to get it on. That That's yeah. a, an expense and that a lot of people can't afford. It's a lot of trouble to go to. There are all kinds of reasons why filters don't work for everyone. Yeah. Um, I want to remind folks that um, we are accepting Q&A questions. So if you have questions as we're having this conversation to pop them into the Q&A chat, we'll get to them at the end of this conversation. Um, now, I'm kind of, you know, kind of going on along with this idea that, you know, there are lots of people outside of Flint saying, oh, this, this whole crisis is over. Um, Jaquanda, I want to talk to you or, or have you talk a little bit about the tension between, um, you know, not people like me, but, you know, news organizations nationally that are not based in Flint, you know, kind of coming in and saying that, you know, this is the end of the water crisis. And, and obviously, you know, everyone on this, on this conversation is saying, that no, it's not. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what's at the root of this disconnect and, and really who gets to decide when or if this ever will be over? The, the people get to decide when it's over. That's just how I feel. They might have to accept the decisions that are made, but they do not have to declare this over. Like their struggles, their trauma, whatever they're going through, they do not have to say that this is over. It's there every day, right? 
um, I, I recently put somebody on blast and I can't remember what news agency it was because I was on Twitter and they said, water crisis over or something. And I told them this is, you know, um, bad reporting. It was reckless. It was political. It was, oh, that's, <laughs> I can't remember. Okay, that's what I put on blast. Um, it was the headline, to be honest. Um, I, I felt that the story spoke to a lot of truth, but we do know that people really don't get beyond headlines. And in the industry, we call this parachuting. They parachute in for a story. It's like the hot thing, right? And you look up media's everywhere. I remember when this got national attention, it was what, 2000 and what, 15? And um, I was standing at City Hall and it was reporters everywhere, everywhere, you know? And we locally, we had been covering water. We had been covering um, water main breaks, boil advisory alerts, you know, like we were following water. And next thing you know, every news outlet in the nation was in Flint. And I just remember uh, telling the police at City Hall, like, look, they're in my spot, man. Like, you know, for them to go move them. But I, I get offended as a journalist, you know, as a person, a community person, as a journalist, because I felt like people before stories and you parachute in and you try to have tell the story because it's not the whole story, which can be damaging to us. And it's also disrespectful. You know, I, I really want journalists to put some time into this or partner with local news agencies to tell this story, like agencies that are already here, boots on the ground, that have a more clear picture of what's going on here. I just, uh, but I don't know what to do about it. I just get furious. And I do things like I did on Twitter <laughs> in my anger. And I'm a Flint resident. I mean, I was just, before this call, I was saying I got my letter in the mail, you know, for this class action suit. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I got two. So um, I'm part of this community. I, I hear the comments and I feel like they're not telling this story. Like I'm looking at comments now from people with stories, the things they say when we report on it, the things they say on social media, some of the things they're still going through, hair loss. Um, some of them are saying they're still having skin problems. They are complaining about how high the water bill is. You know, I've watched people die, literally get legionnaires, hit hard, health just completely fell apart. And a lady, a young lady in her 20s deteriorated. You know, and so I was part of that. I spoke at her funeral. It's just those stories, I feel like they're not spending enough time here to tell. You know, they want the clicks and they want the metrics and the audience. And then they're gone off to the next thing. And we're still here every Monday heading to a community center. I drive past a water line, you know, and it's the same church that's giving COVID testing. So now we're going through that too, right? So I just I just don't feel like they they do us a disservice. That's how I feel. They do us a disservice. I find it to be highly disrespectful. And I can't imagine myself parachuting into another community trying to tell a story like this and hurting them even more. So that's how I feel about it. Yeah, yeah, completely understand that. Thank you for that. Sorry if I get emotional. <laughs> No, it's, it's, this is, this is, I think that's the thing, like, you know, this is, you know, your life, right? Like, th I think that that's part of the, the conversation that we're having, right? Like, there are people that come in and parachute in and, you know, they come in only just for the story, but it's like, no, 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 people live here. Like, Flint is, is a place where people live, right? Um, Anna, I want to turn to you because, you know, part of the reason why you are here is because, you know, you are based in Michigan, right? Like we wanted to make sure that, you know, when we covered Michigan, that we were having, you know, people who were in community with uh, the people that they're covering. Um, and so I want to have you bring you into this conversation a little bit about, um, you know, the accountability that we're talking about, right? Like it's, it, whether it's, you know, with, um, you know, uh, charges or with, you know, policies or even with, you know, the national narrative, you know, this is all kind of, you know, rolling toward accountability. And so we talked about some of those steps 
that are currently moving forward, but some of the underlying problems are still in place. And so in your recent story, you mentioned um, open records legislation to make the state government more transparent as a needed reform. Um, what would that legislation actually do? And, you know, kind of why is it important, you know, for this story? And then, you know, kind of what have been some of the barriers uh, to making those changes? Yes, uh, this is something I have been thinking about for years. I think one of the first articles I wrote specifically about Flint and its water crisis involved open records stuff. Um, this is because uh, Michigan is one of only two states in the country, along with Massachusetts, where the legislature and the governor's office are totally exempt from open records requests. So they don't have to abide by basic transparency standards. They can opt in or opt out as they please, which makes it hard for journalists or citizens or community organizers or scientists or anyone else uh, to get access to information on the critical decisions that powerful people are making that affect our lives. And in the case of Flint, as we can see, it, the stakes are literally life or death. Um, so there are two lawmakers in Michigan, a, a Democrat and a Republican who have been working together for um, years really to uh, bring transparency to the legislature and the governor's office in Michigan. And just to be clear, that's not the only issue with <laughs> secrecy in Michigan, but it's a big one. Um, they made several attempts to push forward uh, this open records bill, but it didn't get traction initially uh, because it just didn't have this uh, support of um, the Republican leadership in the legislature who they just simply did not want to do it. It was just dead. Uh, now the lawmakers who are championing this are both in the Senate. Um, there's been a change in leadership. They're really optimistic about getting it passed uh, this last year. They planned this huge um, unveiling for Sunshine Week in March. And as you can imagine, <laughs> that ended up getting uh, postponed because of COVID. They did have another chance to bring it forward in the fall, but it was delayed by a, a lot of other backlogged legislation and then by the... Um, the hearings that the Senate held on uh, Michigan's presidential election and the clock just ran out. Uh, so um, that's unfortunate, but both senators have told me that they plan to introduce it yet again um, uh, in this coming year to bring transparency to our legislature and to our governor's office, which hopefully can um, help make a rising emergency like Flint uh, uh, have it have it solve it before it escalates basically yeah um and and ben obviously one of the well, maybe not obviously but one of the things that you know kind of got us here is you know the emergency manager um that was in place in flint um and so for years there have been calls to repeal michigan's emergency manager law um and and that law obviously hands political authority over from cities to state appointed officials um is there any movement um, kind of to address that now, or is, is that just kind of like out of the, out of the, the public um, sphere, right? It's a good question because you would expect this to be an area where we saw the crisis leading to some real change, especially with former governor Snyder himself admitting that the law failed. And yet we've seen basically nothing up to this point. I mean, since December 2015, a variety of Flint inspired bills were introduced to uh, repeal the law or at least reform it. <clears throat> and not just from one side of the aisle, but they, they didn't go anywhere. And, and that's especially striking when you consider that the water crisis did lead to some substantial policy reform in another area namely to the State Safe Drinking Water Act. So, you know, Michigan now has some of the most progressive water regulations in the country, but it's notoriously draconian emergency manager law is sitting there untouched. And it seems like nobody's even talking about it anymore, at least not publicly. That doesn't mean nothing has changed. I mean, the law came in for such criticism after Flint became big news that it, it became politically unviable to make much use of it. So all of the cities and school districts that were under emergency management have had local control restored. We haven't seen any new emergency managers appointed, but the law is still there, ready and waiting to be used if the political climate changes. So why is that? To get to your question, I mean, my understanding is that at the state level, it's, it's two things. First of all, too many Republicans who've supported the EM law over the years are reluctant to admit they were wrong, even after Flint. And even for those who are open to the idea of reforming it, 
it's, it's not exactly the issue of the moment. So there's not a lot of political will there. Having said that, I've heard that there's at least some conversation going on behind closed doors about making reform a priority again, and that as soon as it reaches a critical mass in Lansing, it will become a public conversation. So, of course, what many people in Flint and other communities affected by emergency management have called for is outright repeal of the law, and this could become an opportunity to mobilize again around that demand. Um, although we can't repeal it by referendum, as was done in, in 2012 with an earlier version of the law. Um, for those who continue to believe that the state needs some way of intervening in cities that are struggling financially, there are any number of um, proposals for how to make those kinds of interventions more accountable, how to ensure that local interests and considerations of public health are prioritized and so on. So, for example, some people have proposed requiring EMs to post $5 million bonds when they take their positions that they would forfeit if they engaged in gross negligence. Others have proposed putting financial management teams in place rather than individual autocrats, including local ombuds people. We could look at mandating some kind of public participation process within the response to financial emergencies and requiring popular votes on certain kinds of proposals, for example, changing a drinking water source. So over the years, we've accumulated quite a few ideas about what to do instead of having the state take cities over unilaterally and appoint what amount to dictators to govern them by fiat. But we just haven't done much with those ideas yet. Uh, so hopefully we're right on the cusp of some kind of reinvigoration of that conversation. But just like with anything else, you know, public pressure of some kind would be helpful if the issue is going to be made a priority. Now. Um, and we know that a lot of public pressure usually comes in the form of academic research and books and, and things like that. Um, not only, um, Ben, obviously you wrote a book, Anna wrote a book, um, but also some of the research that um, people like Yvonne are, are doing, right? Like in the academic sector or in the health sector. And so I want to turn to, to Yvonne really quickly before we get to our last question for the panelists and then we hop into um, the Q&A, which the, the Q&A is popping. So, um, Yvonne, um, what do you think the role of researchers is in helping communities get justice? I mean, you talked so eloquently earlier about, you know, kind of this idea of justice and, and, and what it would, would feel like for the people of Flint. Um, is, there, is there a role, you know, like for if there were no constraints on, you know, your time, obviously there are, and resources, <laughs> what would you study? What would you, what research would you do? What, what and what do you think that other cities should be studying and paying attention to, you know, kind of in, 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 as a part of like learning from what happened in Flint. Yeah, thank you, Talia. W one of the first thing I think should happen as it relates to research is that there is a clear pathway to engage communities in what the research will be, how the research will be conducted and in, in what ways it will be conducted, right? So we, we've stood up here, we have what we call the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, which is a partnership between our community and academic partners. We believe, if, if in fact, if we just take the water crisis as an example, when the citizens saw, saw the water look different, smelled the water look different, and we could have partnered and done research and all it, with, then you got the issue. The community understands what the issues are that they're facing. We need our academic partners to come and walk along beside us and work with us. We don't necessarily know and, and, and really wanna do all of the, you know, understand the research jargon and all of that, but there are ways to communicate the important things about research so that we understand how that research is conducted and why. Research is simply saying, I've got a question that I need an answer to. Our academic partners have been trained and prepared to do the necessary studies, put the, the surveys together to get at those, those, those answers. But the research team also needs to have community voices involved in that. So the questions are relevant to what the community's needs are. And we are sure then that not only is the research being effective, but the outcomes of that research will really resonate and make a difference in communities. There has to be clear, important partnerships open and transparent communication. And most of all, once the research is done, it can't just sit in a book. It just can't sit on a shelf. It just can't go into a journal for somebody's next level of academic pursuit. It must come back to the community in a way that something can be done 
that will make an ongoing change for the residents in those communities. Flint is one example, but there are many communities who need the same type of investment that we're calling for here. And we trust that the work that we're doing will be an example that other communities will, will be able to, to follow, which again is why our academic partners are so important because the data drives the question, the, the data drives policy, the data drives the resources. And so together, community and academic partners working together, identifying what the issues are and working collectively to resolve those issues and then utilize the results from those, those investigations. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, I, I wanna make sure that our audience gets a chance to, um, to be in conversation with you too. I'm gonna ask you a rapid fire question um, so that everybody else can jump in to this great conversation. So um, also for people, if you're, if you're watching, make sure you're adding your questions in and we're gonna pick a couple to, to try to go through. Um, so we've, we've talked through all these different actions, you know, kind of thinking about research, thinking about, you know, policy changes, thinking about, you know, kind of money and, and you know, the, the settlement issues that, that could possibly happen. Um, I'm wondering for you, uh, what would true justice look like? And what are the big changes that maybe are not widely discussed, but that you think should be on the table? Rapid fire. So I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna go Ben, Yvonne, Jaquanda. Okay, so one thing really quick that I really don't think has received uh, nearly enough attention. When we talk about making decisions about water more transparent and accountable and democratic, we can't just be talking about emergency management. We also need some reform um, in the way that water is managed right here in Flint. We need reform of our local water utility. We need to make sure that the people who are actually dispensing the water on a daily basis are doing it in a way that it again is transparent so that when issues arise, we know who to go to, we know we'll get a response. We need to have you know, residents overseeing to the extent that that's possible, the way in which that water is managed. We're supposed to have a water system advisory council in place here in Flint. It's now a matter of state law, should have been in place already. We're still waiting on that. And so you know, it's things like that that would allow residents to exercise some everyday oversight of how their water is actually actually being managed. And those are steps that we're not even close to taking yet here in Flint in any meaningful way. Okay. And then Yvonne, Jaquanda, and then Anna, I'm sorry. What does justice look like? Equal opportunity, equal right, equal access to what is a human right, clean, affordable drinking water. Jaquanda. Um, for me, um, justice for Flint is equity. Um, when we started the water crisis, we was already behind decades. And that's because we just do not have an equitable community. And so we need to bridge gaps. We need equity. They need resources. They need education here. We have high illiteracy. I feel like if we can build an equitable community, we can prevent things like the water crisis from happening to communities like Flint. So that's what I'm working towards, equity. Awesome. Anna. This is a bit of an echo of that, but um, I would love, I don't think it's up to me to say what's justice for Flint, but I would love to see a broader conversation of the context for why we have gotten so, um, so, so accustomed to these chronically disinvested cities in Flint and all over the country that we have come to think of it as normal. It's not normal. Um, and I think the, um, I think we, it is beyond time to start reckoning with the choices that have caused and prolonged that state of being. Okay. I'm coming back, hi. All right, so let's get to questions from the audience. Um, we actually have a, bunch of questions um, sort of related to the class action suit that Ben was speaking about earlier and detailing. Um, just wanting to know the extent of like what it really would cover. Does the settlement provide compensation for property damage from corrosion of interior plumbing or if you have a lead service line? And do these amounts cover lifelong health care related to people's exposure to lead? 
So does it cover, you know, lifelong health care and also in, like infrastructure of their homes? So I can follow up on that real quick. Um, again, if, if you're a homeowner in Flint, then you can get up to $1,000. Uh, you know, I, I had my wa hot water heater burst in the middle of all of this. I mean, that alone is, you know, several hundred dollars. Um, if you think about other kinds of damage that might have been done to interior plumbing and appliances and so forth, it could easily um, get beyond a thousand dollars. So I know there are people who would like to see that number raised. Um, <clears throat> as far as long-term health needs, I mean, uh, basically you, you take what you can get from a, a settlement like this. I mean, so some of the people who have suffered the most, say, who got Legionnaire's disease and have had their bodies compromised long-term, they're probably going to see the, the biggest payouts. And it might be enough to fund some of the care they need long-term. But for most people, no, I don't, I don't think that it's going to be anything like that. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question about uh, what remedies are available at the federal level? Why did the Environmental Protection Agency fail to enforce Title VI of the Civil Rights Act? And Tulia, I'm going to start with you because I, I know you've done some work reporting there. Yeah, um, so I haven't done anything super recent, but um, in the past I've written about Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and how EPA, um, well, one, it was it was not recent, not um, used a ton by environmentalists and because partially it was um, a, a slow wheel uh, to kind of turn to get justice. Um, and then EPA, once you kind of finally got your Title VI case, um, and so Title VI of the Civil Rights Act basically um, ensures that, you know, any entity that gets you know, state or, or government funds can't do anything that would be like racist, essentially. Um, and so what would happen is that EPA, even if they got these cases, they wouldn't really find any, any discriminatory impacts, which really meant that there was no remedy for um, the people, even if there was uh, some harm, there just was, there was no remedy. So people didn't use it. Um, I, I'm not, I don't think that there was a Title VI case and someone can correct me if, if there was, but um, there was. Ben, you're, um, you're yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, the, so there, there was, I mean, it's, it's a long story. We probably don't have, have the time to get all the way into it. But yeah, there were there were complaints lodged with the EPA that went through the Civil Rights Office. And, and so there wasn't anything decided about the Flint water crisis case specifically, but there were issues with the Michigan Department of, um, of Environmental Quality going back to the 90s that the EPA said needed to be addressed. And that in and of itself was a historic ruling. Right, right, exactly. And that was like one of the only ones that they ever did. But yeah, so no, absolutely. So I, I think the part of it is that, you know, Title VI is an imperfect um, remedy and um, it's not well used. It's not um, a, a, a great, um, an easy uh, kind of road to, to, to go through either. So I think that's part of it. Okay, we're also seeing a lot of questions about infrastructure. Um, so is replacement of the municipal water supply piping complete or still ongoing? And if it's ongoing, like where in the process are we? Uh, maybe Yvonne can jump in. Well, yeah, well, I was going to say it's still ongoing. And I think that's one of the big issues when we talk about uh, where we are. And again, this is a long story has been said. We have to go all the way back and start talking about Karagande and, and understand what that is. There needs to be transparency about the process being utilized to get to a, a really improved infrastructure. We've got plots of, we got large spaces of land where there's no one flushing. And so even if you do your best, you've got, you got to, You've got consideration of contaminants in your in your water, even if it's not lead. And let's be clear, the Flat River in and of itself is not bad and it's got a bad rap. It was the process that was used. So, so when people think about Flint and they think about the river, no, we're not on the Flint water. We're, the Flint River is no longer the municipal source. So that isn't the issue now. The issue now is the infrastructure is larger than we have really use for right now with a city of this size. There's some things that need to be corrected. So I, I would just, to make it simple, let's be sure we can be very transparent about what the process is, because if we are not clear about what's going on, it's gonna be very difficult to get to a place of trust. Cynthia, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, question sort of uh, taking a step back a bit. What do people usually get wrong or what common misconceptions do you run into when covering or discussing the water crisis? And Jaquanda, let's, let's start with you on that one. 
Um, I think people always assume it was just lead. Um, they didn't take in consideration like all the bacterial things that we had going on in the city, including legionnaires. Um, people assume that by now the pipes are fixed, which you just heard, Ms. Yvonne, they're not, you know, um, some of the homes with the highest lead level still haven't had their pipes replaced. I know that for a fact. Um, so there's an assumption that it's it's over, you know, it's done. They don't hear anything about it anymore. And then I have to say, no, we're still going through a water crisis. And there's also an assumption that everybody has an awful story. And I, this is a young lady that I know, and she said that she gets nervous anytime someone asks her about the water crisis because her story is different. Her children didn't have rashes. Their hair didn't fall out. You know, the, her, the, she has a higher income bracket than most here, right? And so she didn't face the same challenges. So it's an assumption that everybody in this city was impacted the same way, but they weren't. So those are the main things that I go through. And can, can I echo that just quickly? Because uh, when we first started off in the water crisis, we, we, um, we really set up some places in the community for children to get lead tested. And, and I was helping to set up one of those events. A reporter comes in and asks about it. And he says, I need a story. And I said, OK, I'm a resident of Flint. And he looked at me and said, I don't mean you. I mean, so there's a stereotypical view of what our community looks like and who was impacted. But I, I say to you, the water in the pipes don't get to a resident that has a high education attainment and has, a res has resources and say, oh, I'm not going to go there. It goes to everybody's house. So everybody in this community is affected. And sometimes when we talk about inequities, when it is viewed that only one segment of the community is affected, it's easy for others to be dismissed. But all of us are affected by this. And that's the story that should be told, the story of all of us, good, bad, and the ugly, to ensure that we get the remedies that this community needs. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, what is the best path to achieving water confidence in Flint? And what partners or assistance would most benefit the community in its journey to water confidence? Um, maybe Jaquanda or Yvonne or, or Ben. I think in my head, I know. <laughs> I think that the only time, that's time, right? You know, I think that we, we can't expect this community to trust in what government says to them after they've been poisoned like okay your pipes are replaced your water is good get to drinking it right that's the expectation for some reason like I see all these different comments from people who don't live here and that's the expectation but if if someone's wife cheats on them or husband cheats on them and they say look I'm not cheating anymore I'm all yours do you just start trusting them tomorrow so it's time. And some people may die with that distrust. It is what it is. You know, the damage is done. And that I think has to be accepted. It has to be accepted that people do not trust, be okay with it, because it was a, it was just, it was a horrible situation that you could not go to your tap and turn on water. You know, you were poisoned, something that you wake up every day and you don't even think about. You don't think your government is going to do this to you, right? And then people will expect you to get over it. You know, I think that t time will tell. And I, I don't, me personally, I don't think I ever would trust water again. Like, I just don't. You know, I think I'm going to take that to my deathbed, you know, be somewhere traveling, still drinking bottled water because I'm terrified of what might come out of the tap. So it could be 10, 20, 30 years from now. And people may still not trust the water. And there's nothing you can do about it except do your job. You know, do your job, be transparent, and maybe, just maybe, one day, things will change and stop expecting it to happen overnight. Yeah, and I, I would support that by saying that consistent action. Let's let's see what the plan is, and then let's follow the plan. If we if if there is something put in place that says these are the things that we're going to do, then let's see that action happening and see it on an ongoing basis. Let's we've got to move beyond the start and stop and hope that somebody's going to start it again the next time. But let's put that plan in place, make it available to the residents, and then let's continue to move it forward. 
one more quick thing, if, if I if I can just add on, um, I, I also think we need to get beyond just talking about trust and start talking about the trustworthiness of the people in institutions who are asking for trust. Because sometimes, you know, when we talk about trust, it's almost as if the residents have some kind of problem, right? That, you know, the water's just fine now. What's wrong with them for continuing to distrust it? Um, whereas, in fact, a lot of the people in institutions we're talking about have yet to prove their trustworthiness. A lot of these people who came in saying they were all about rebuilding trust in Flint after they finally acknowledged the problem ended up doing things that only generated more distrust, right? So um, again, we have to be really careful about this whole trust narrative degenerating into kind of a victim blaming narrative, whereas where it's the, the problem of the residents for not trusting rather than the institutions for not being trustworthy. Okay, uh, next question. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration's limit for lead in bottled water is five parts per billion. Does Michigan have such a health have such health based standards? Um, Yvonne or Ben, maybe you could take this one. Well, uh, so bottled water is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, as opposed to tap water, which is regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. So you have two totally different regulatory standards that um, apply to those different kinds of water. Um, with bottled water, uh, yes, it's five parts per billion, but you've got other issues with the way bottled water is actually monitored. Um, you basically are dependent upon the bottled water providers to monitor the, their own product and report out the data. Tap water has a higher um, threshold for lead, but it's it's very regularly monitored. Um, and so we know a lot uh, about it, at least in a general way, at a system-wide level. One of the issues we learned a lot about in Flint is that you can have one thing going on in, you know, system-wide on average, and you can have a very different thing going on in any particular home. So you have to be really careful about relying on these kinds of general standards to make sweeping claims about water safety in any water system. Now, as for Michigan, there has been and um, I think that that it's we're supposed to go from 15 parts per billion to 12 parts per billion, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I can't remember by what year that's supposed to go into effect officially. It's it's, but um, there has been talk about bringing that that threshold down even lower because we know that there's no safe level of lead, and ideally you want the amount of lead in your water to be zero. But you know there are all kinds of logistical complications involved in bringing the, the levels down that low. So we have to realize these aren't public health based standards, right? They, they have a lot to do with just the feasibility of realizing you know, those levels within a water system. Um, how likely are similar water crises to hit other American cities? And does the country need to be thinking about, what does the country need to be thinking about in terms of water quality as it reopens schools and other institutions where water has been stagnant over the past year. Anna, uh, do you wanna take a shot at that? Uh, sure, um, yeah, the short answer is that it already has. <laughs> um, just in the last few years, there have been um, water crises in Pittsburgh and Newark, New Jersey and Trenton and other communities besides. I mean, well before Flint, there is a huge uh, water crisis in water Washington, DC. Um, the problems with drinking water safety and infrastructure are systematic and uh, as are the problems with concentrated poverty and some of the other issues that we saw in Flint's story. And while um, what happened in Flint escalated in a, an unusual way for a lot of reasons, it's not a singular story. I mean, this is a broader, um, there's, we have a broader challenge to deal with as, as a country. Um, and one thing that I think is important to mention is that while it's very much true that um, communities that are chronically disinvested are much more likely to bear the brunt of this, making it an environmental justice issue. It's communities that are more privileged are not immune. And I think that sometimes people make that um, kind of a simple thing. I've, I've come across this a lot when I talk to people, they think if they live in a kind of a wealthier community, then this won't touch them. And we have, first of all, we have lead pipes everywhere. We have some drinking water uh, regulation problems like everywhere. And when people, especially now, are returning to schools and other institutions where water has been shut off for a long time, you're gonna run into a lot of the same problems that you saw in Flint, which has, as Yvonne was kind of mentioning, like a lot of vacancy issues, which means the water sits stagnant in pipes or moves more slowly through pipes 
this lets the water get more contaminated um, because it, 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 it just gets saturated while it like just sort of sits there. You need to be moving the water to keep it healthy. There are um, uh, strong uh, flushing protocols that are out there and water testing protocols that are out there that would be wise for people to uh, be looking into well before they're inviting students back into stool schools or employees back into their other institution. And uh, I think folks should definitely be looking at that. Um, certainly if they're a decision maker at these institutions, but also if they're um, a community member in them. And Cynthia, that's a very interesting question because a lot of times people will say they've got a problem, but it's not like Flint. But a lead problem, an infrastructure problem is a problem. And so what we, again, are encouraged to think about it, the, the issue across this nation, we have an aging infrastructure. And if there is a national mandate, a national conversation about what do we do with an aging infrastructure, because at some point, all of our communities will be affected by something very similar, even if it didn't happen as a result of an emergency manager. Thank you. Um, I have a question that I think would be interesting to hear from everyone on if they have some advice here. And that is, what is one piece of advice you would give to communities fighting for safe drinking water? I, I, keep, fight, keep fighting. Yeah, that exactly. That's what I was going to say because this this fight was led by passionate residents, mothers who saw something wrong with their water, right? And they just kept fighting and fighting until someone listened. So you have to keep fighting. Is it? And it, I can't tell you how long the journey will be, but you know, if you don't fight then we're worse off for it. Then we, we have to continue the fight. And I've, I'm pretty sure if you talk to any activists around here, it, it wasn't easy. It's not easy. You know, even a ridicule and how tired they are. I said I was going to throw a, throw a gathering just for the activists alone so they could get a break, like some self-care, right? Because they're still fighting seven years later. They're still out here stumping um, the water and trying to be heard about these issues. So I'm with Yvonne, like keep fighting. There's no simple remedy. There's no book on it of how to go about this fight, but you just have to keep fighting. Um, I wanna add something not about um, obviously citizens, but I think, um, one thing that I think that Flint could show is that maybe um, the federal government or elected officials need to consider um, other ways and other, other I guess, standards of science um, as, a, as a burden of proof. Because I think that um, so much of, so many people in the community were kind of dismissed when they, you know, came with, you know, their bottles of water because they hadn't met you know, the scientific standards of EPA or of, you know, um, the Michigan, you know, environmental you know, department or whatever. And so I think that as we, you know, citizen science and citizen, you know, kind of accountability um, has a place, I think, in, um, in governmental decisions. And I think that maybe there should probably be some conversation among some elected officials about, you know, kind of, okay, well, what is the standard that we're interested in? And what is, and even if you know it doesn't meet our standard, what's enough to say, okay, you know what? Well, this feels like there's something there. Maybe we should look into it. One more thing to add to that, you know, in, in these struggles, often it is the case that scientific evidence of some kind is really crucial for getting people in positions of power to take you seriously and to, to take action. It often involves some level of collaboration relationship between people within communities and people coming in from the outside, people in academia, people who are quote unquote experts. We really need robust relationships like that, but we've learned in Flint that you know communities have to be really careful about how they structure those relationships. And if you're going to bring people in from the outside, know that those relationships can easily go south and result in some real abuses. And so we really need robust institutions within communities that ensure that residents who enter into those kinds of relationships have some protection when things start to go wrong. And Yvonne is doing great work in, in that 
respect. Um, and you know, when you have academics coming in, respecting that that infrastructure and working within it and so forth, and really putting the community first, then it it can work well. But it can also go very badly. And so this is something that people in other communities should know so that they can take steps to protect themselves. I also feel like we need to get back to elected officials work for us. You know, all too often we forget that, you know, we vote and we put people in place and we elect them so they will listen to us and that we can make change in our communities. And for some reason, it seems like we're working for them. You know, um, we, we forget that we, we have the power, right? We have the power. And I think we really, really, really need to lean on that power that we have in communities, you know, and come together when elected officials are not listening. You know, show up when they're not listening, show up to council meetings, show up at city hall and be heard. You know, we have a tendency to just kind of complain amongst ourselves about problems and not really take it to them in a way where we can really, really be heard. And, you know, I think that's an ongoing battle. Okay. Well, on that note, that is our time for tonight. I want to thank our speakers for this informative discussion. Um, I'd like to give a special thank you to our sponsor for tonight's event, McKinsey and & Company, and also our co-presenters for this event, Flint Beat and Michigan Radio. Um, video of tonight's event will be available on ProPublica's YouTube channel.